we have a good crowd, so let's get started. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm Arnold Ross from IBM. Uh, I'm part of the Open Technology Group at IBM, and I've been involved in, uh, in OpenSSF for a year and a half or so now. And so I'm going to give you a very quick intro to what we're talking about, and then we'll follow up with the panel, uh, my esteemed colleagues here. And we'll do a, an introduction of everybody at this time. Um, so we are going to focus, I mean, you know, this is really probably not necessary. I th you know, I assume everybody is aware that uh, software is under attack and that's include open uh, source. And so the open SSF was basically created to try to address this problem. It's obviously not a problem that any single company can tackle on their own. And so OpenSSF is a Linux Foundation project that aims at trying to help, you know, improve the security posture of all open source. And so it actually was started quite a while ago in 2020, but at the time we had COVID and companies were not too sure what the economic impact was going to be. So the organization was not fully funded. It, you know, it was kind of like a, a slow start. And, uh, but in, in 2022, there was a reboot where we switched to a fully funded model that allowed the organization to really start uh, in a real manner. And so this is basically the structure that we are talking about. There are many different activities. My goal is not to present everything, but to give you an understanding of what we are focused on today. So just briefly, you know, we have the governing board level, there's the TAC underneath, and then we have a whole bunch of working groups, and each working group focuses in different areas. The part that we're talking about today is the supply chain integrity working group in black in the middle there. And each one of these working groups themselves, you know, have different sub initiatives underneath. They can be spatial interest groups or projects that focus on actual code. And what we are talking about again here, this is kind of the list of everything that goes on, but I just want to focus uh, you, your attention to the top right corner over there, again in black, the supply chain integrity working group with the different activities underneath. So we have Salsa, we have Fresca, and S2C2F. And there is another group, which is the SIG, uh, supply chain integrity positioning that kind of tries to help with the coordination of some of the aspect. So, this is just a general pointer to open SSF and you know, a call for action for everybody. This is essentially just what I wanted to present as a general framework to kind of frame what we are going to talk about today. And so our goal for today, this, the, the goal of this uh, panel is really to give you a better understanding of the different uh, you know, uh, technologies related to SCI in particular. So with that, and with that further ado, maybe we can, uh, people want to look at this one. I don't know which one is better as background, but it's kind of in our face. I can leave that as background if you guys want. So, so let me first you know, allow my colleagues here on the panel introduce themselves. So I think I need to <laughs> specifically call out that my colleague Melba, this is not Melba, Melba is unfortunately sick, and so she couldn't actually participate in this panel today. And so, lucky us, we actually had one of her colleagues from Red Hat be able to step in in her place. So, Laura, why don't you introduce yourself? Oops, well, doesn't work. Oh, thank you. I already messed up. <laughs> Laura C. from Red Hat. I'm a, a manager of supply chain operations uh, in our product security department. Uh, Jay White from Microsoft. I work in the open source strategy ecosystem team. Um, I do all things uh, liaising between our supply chain security folks and our engineering services, uh, our information security and cybersecurity folks over there under um, our security org. And then I 
do a whole bunch of work inside of the open SSF uh, to make sure that we all are operating in a, in a safe and a comfortable supply chain environment. Uh, and I'm uh, Mike Lieberman. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Kusari, a software supply chain security company. I am also a Salsa steering committee member, as well as a maintainer on uh, the Fresca um, CI and build system project. So again, I mean, the goal for us is to get you a better understanding of kind of the alphabet soup that's hidden behind some of those names. So namely, we have three main technologies we're talking about. There is Salsa, Fresca, and S2C2F. And so I don't know if you know, or if everybody here knows what those things mean, but hopefully at the end of this talk, you will know. And, and so they, each of them kind of represent one of those uh, pillars. So Laura, why don't you tell us first what Salsa is about? So Salsa is the um, supply chain levels for software artifacts. It's a mouthful, so I just shortened it to Salsa. Um, and it's essentially a framework that uh, it is a, a set of guidelines for supply chain security specifically. Um, it, it is uh, organized in uh, levels of assurance. Um, so there's uh, um, there's the incremental adoption through the levels of, assu of, of assurance, and uh, and that's to help prevent um, tampering and uh, improve um, build integrity, and also to uh, help secure packages and infrastructure um, throughout the build process. And then, uh, if you think of it in terms of if I know you may have heard the analogy for S bombs being the um, in ingredients list. Um, you can think of salsa as being the um, the food handling guidelines around um, the the pipeline. So it's um, it, it, if you think of it in that in that terms, it's that that seal, the evidence seal to um, to show that it, there it's tamper um, proof, and also to show that there you can verify um, the, who the create creator was with that stamp of approval. And then also, uh, you can use it to uh, to help um, just ver verify uh, the provenance of the the metadata. All right, thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to skip Jay for a moment, and we'll go to Mike, who's going to tell us what Fresca is about, and you'll understand why I skip Jay for now. <laughs> um, so uh, Fresca is a which it's a backronym, which I'm not gonna <laughs> go into too uh, much detail right now, but it's, um, it's a build system uh, intended to actually hit the highest levels of Salsa. Um, it stemmed actually, it came out of uh, the CNCF's uh, tag security uh, supply chain working group originally, where there was a project uh, called the Secure Software Factory Reference Architecture which described how to, you know, build a, uh, to create a build system, a cloud native build system that was secure and, you know, was using the best of sort of breed um, build frameworks and whatnot. And so that's where Salsa came in. And so um, Fresca is an actual sort of implementation of that. And so Fresca consists of a bunch of cloud native um, tools such as Tekton, Tekton Chains, uh, Spiffy Spire, and, and so on to sort of uh, provide a bunch of build infrastructure as well as a set of abstractions on top of that build infrastructure to enforce stuff like salsa rules. And then um, eventually uh, it, it'll also be used to um, enforce stuff like S2C2F. And that's where I'll hand it over to Jay. Good call, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Doing Arnold's job for him. I want Arnold to say my name. <laughs> All right, um, S2C2F, so uh, the Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework um, began as a framework that's heavily utilized today inside of Microsoft, but we thought it was such a, a great tool that we decided to publish it and bring it over to the open SF so it can be further uh, improved and, and developed and then brought out uh, to the community. It is a consumption framework mainly for the end user, and mainly focused on dependency management. Right? Um, in that vein, it focuses heavily 
on the ingestion of open source components. Um, it's rooted in threat and risk, uh, the threat and risk-based approach uh, that we all uh, are concerned with. So you'll see a threat matrix, and based on this threat matrix, it takes a lot of those threats and says, okay, well, let's break those out now, and how do we mitigate them? And what it does is it does this through eight different practices, um, going all the way from ingestion all the way to fixing it upstream, which is, um, you know, dare I say aspirational in nature, but something that's also very much uh, thought about and on the minds. Um, but it breaks those eight practices up amongst uh, four different levels. Right? Um, so you can have level one all the way uh, through level four, which is very heavily, uh, level one being, you know, scanning for known vulnerabilities, uh, you know, know or, or get some type of consistency with how your organization's ingesting uh, open source components, all the way to being able to validate S-bombs and, and uh, validate and then the quality of the S-bombs and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, again, S2C2F, uh, consumption framework focused on dependency management, eight practices, four levels. All right, thank you for that uh, first uh, round of introduction of the technologies. So let, let's go a little deeper now. And so, Laura, Salsa 1.0 just got published. I think, it, you know, it's fair enough to recognize that Salsa was started by Google, uh, similar to what Jay was describing. Uh, they had developed that internally, and they felt like this was something that could be useful to broader than just Google, so they contributed their specification to OpenSSF and it's been developed within OpenSSF since then. It's been several months and there was just Salsa 1.0 published. So Laura, can you tell us what's in that Salsa 1.0? Because it's quite different from what was initially contributed by Google and even publicly available on the uh, Salsa dev website. Yeah, that's right. So the first um, Salsa 0 0.1 uh, ac version actually contained about 20 different um, requirements, and the version 1.0 uh, only has five. Um, but those five are uh, centered around um, provenance generation and um, uh, isolation strength. And so the, the, there are different tracks in Salsa? Yes, so there is the, the that's build. That's new, right, in 1.0. Yeah, that's, so the build track um, currently, it, as it's um, published, is focused on build system. And then um, there is a source track as well as a, um, a provenance track. Mike, you wanted to add something? Sure, yeah, no, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add in there, you know, because I know uh, one of the things we've, we've heard some feedback from folks is like they, they saw that uh, we went from having, you know, four levels to now down to three levels. Are we making things less secure or, or hey, we're not doing code review. Does that mean code review isn't important? Um, and just wanted to clarify that, yeah, no, that's not the case. Um, we wanted to really have laser focus for 1.0. Um, we wanted to really focus around, uh, we found where the biggest gap was, was around that build provenance. There's a ton of great uh, best practices and frameworks around doing code reviews, around distributing artifacts securely, but around that build piece, around establishing provenance in that build piece, we found sort of like that's where the big gap was, and so that's where we focused. And then in addition to that, some of the stuff that we found with the four levels was level four, which was aspirational, was also too vague to be really actionable. And so we found that um, a lot of folks were just getting really confused. And for us, um, we'd much rather not have the level than to actually have something that there's so much confusion around that people are not sure how to implement. They're not sure what it even means. And that confusion can actually lead to worse security. So we sort of pulled that back a little bit, but stay tuned probably in a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, you should see uh, a draft uh, coming out. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I will also add to this. I'm, I'm personally also involved in the Salsa specification work. And, and you know, the way I see it is uh, Google came with this. It, there is a lot of it that tried to capture what they were doing internally and that they, you know, using. But, of course, you know, I'm an old standards guy. <laughs> and, you know, this s happens all the time. When you start 
putting your, your work you know, under the scrutiny of a much broader community, you realize there's a lot of things that you kind of assume are obvious that don't uh, you know, uh, pan out in a larger community. And so a lot of the, the what's in it is actually a big improvement over what was before because uh, there are things that were a bit vague and bit aspirational that were actually removed and what's there it, I think is a much stronger solid foundation and that's the advantage we have and this is a choice the group made. We could have kept working on that spec for much longer to try to address all of the scope that was in the initial contribution. Instead this, the group said look we don't want to keep you know, work on this spec forever and have everybody wait for something to come out, it's better to reduce the scope, remove the things that we're not too sure about, and then focus on what we can really strengthen now and that we provide some uh, foundation for uh, everybody to use now that we feel comfortable is stable enough that we won't have to change uh, moving forward, but we can build on. And so this is really what it is. And so I think some people have felt a bit let down because when they looked into it, not everybody was following uh, all the evolution. And when they started, they saw the announcement of 1.0, they looked into it and they say, wait a minute, this is nothing like <laughs> the previous version, what happened? We literally had people say, this doesn't deserve being called 1.0, should call it 0 0.5 or something. But so, you know, it's arguable whether it should have been called 1.0 or not, but I think the sentiment in the group was that it actually, you know, in a, although reduced scope, it is a much stronger foundation to build on. Jay. Uh, yeah, so w one of the things I wanted to make sure that everybody understood and was, and, and was clear about uh, these efforts under the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group, we wanted things uh, that, that were developed that were usable, right? Not just put a bunch of uh, stuff out there that sounds good. You see the fancy names, and and you're and you're able to to, to make up m memes about them and all that, and, <laughs> and and you know, do they actually work? And while we were, and, and of course, I, I sit in all these rooms as well. So does Mike and and, and, you know, and, and Han Arnold. So w while we were actually uh, you know, going through the process of breaking these things down, busting them open, and saying, hey, what? actually works in the community and what how does this scale right how can we scale for improvement how can we scale for usability how can we scale with emerging threats how can we scale um, with emerging security concerns how can we scale with different industries that have different concerns that are now building software and services so and, and taking a step back and, and doing what we did here we said we can take this we can bust open into different tracks, this track works. Now, we can focus on this track, and these things are usable, and when you get them, you can read it and you'll say, oh, well this is, I mean, this is a, a, a shortened experience from the, well, well yeah, now, now go and implement it, and, and come on in and, and, and work with us and, and see you on the next track, right, so. All right, so thanks. Laura, so who is Salsa for? So uh, there are, uh, also can be used for both um, software producers and consumers. So with, um, with software producers like Red Hat, we use it to model um, the specifications uh, for um, pipeline hardening. And so we can take that as the guidelines um, and also um, apply it for evidence for attestations for things uh, like compliance for industry standards. So there's, um, even if, you're, uh, if your company or organization isn't necessarily um, you know, involved with the US federal government as a vendor, um, you can still use that um, as a, um, like a, a kind of badge of honor, right? To say like uh, you are salsa you know, level three and this is what it means and also there's um, other than just the executive order, there's the S NIST SSCF and then NIST 800-161 and 800-53 that uh, maps really nicely to SALSA, the SALSA framework. And so uh, whatever your use, use case is um, as a producer, whether you, you have compliance um, uh, uh, you know, related um, issues that you're hoping to 
um, resolved, you can use the implementation steps to, um, to know exactly how to do the things that, the, uh, that they're be we're being asked to do. And then from a consumer standpoint, um, you're, in, you're informing decision makers on uh, what software packages are most secure. So, um, sorry, in increasing confidence with, um, with every level of insurance. So when you're looking for um, you know, software to use, having that, um, it really helps uh, kind of highlight that security posture for that software package. Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to add on uh, something there. You know, from the Fresca standpoint, you know, we, we are using Salsa both to produce Salsa compliant software, but also for stuff like the base images, we enforce that the base image, you know, we can have the rules that, that enforce that the base images that you're using to build on are also Salsa compliant. So you're starting from a reasonable baseline of security. And then everything you build on top of that is just sort of, um, you're sort of like layering on on that security. And so by the way, Fresca provides what level of salsa? <laughs> so yes, um, as of 1.0, it supports um, level three, as long as you're running it in a reasonably secured Kubernetes cluster, um, you know, where you're trusting that, you know, admins are not attacking the cluster and that sort of thing. But with that said, uh, we actually have some open uh, <laughs> pull requests um, that Parth and, and Brendan have been working on uh, for a while now for to into Tecton and Tecton chains that can actually protect against even malicious actors within, um, you know, who have administrative access to your Kubernetes cluster uh, via stuff like Spiffy and Spire that will actually ensure that even if somebody does come in and attempt to compromise the build while it's running, it would get detected and uh, would not get signed, would not generate provenance and, and all that. Do you have a question? Say the latter, so it, it helps with the evidence. So having the, being able to provide that evidence for whatever attestation you're you're you know hoping to achieve. A question there. Yeah. And run. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned Fresca is an implementation. So obviously, enterprises are not going to implement Fresca on their own, right? Yep. So we, so what, what do you think is the lead time to get something like a Jenkins or uh, or a GitHub-based CI/CD solution with actions and such to be Fresca compliant? So GitHub Actions already, already. Um, is. Uh, there are um, ones that have come out of. Uh, uh, actually, the Salsa team, um, a lot of folks at Google, as well as other folks uh, in GitHub and other places, um, have built uh, some stuff that actually is Salsa 3 uh, compliant. Um, and so on that end, it's quite quick. Some of the legacy systems that are out there, like your Jenkins, it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, and there's some work that's happening on there, but because... Uh, you know, Jenkins has some made some architectural decisions decades ago that are still have impacts today. Um, certain things like Jenkins by default is very open, and Salsa by default really wants everything to be very closed. That's a little bit more difficult. And so on that end, yeah, there's there's some stuff that's already out there, and. Fresca is not, you know, we recognize that not everybody's just going to adopt a Fresca and start running everything in Kubernetes, but it, it is something that we believe that at least the architecture can be used as an example that folks can go and say, oh, okay, I want to replace Tecton with this thing, but I'm going to be looking at how it's been built and try and follow that, that process. Sorry about this. All right. Um, so the Salsa 1.0, uh, it's mostly, when you look at it, it's for auditors, uh, one point. Uh, but you're saying that Fresca 1.0 is aligned with Salsa level 3. Yes. Right? So how, how did we end up with so much disparity? You know, where 1.0 for general consumption is only level 1. Yeah. 
Oh, oh no, no. That's, no. That, that might be a misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah no, no. Um, yeah, so Salsa version 1.0. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, Salsa 1.0 is intended for general use, both from software producers who can who Salsa 1.0. The you know, with Salsa 1.0, they can go out and say, "Hey, I produce software, and here's the provenance of that software." So you have some evidence that, "Hey, it's been built in a relatively secure way." Um, in particular, Salsa level, you know, one is pretty much saying, "Are you recording the fact that you ran a build?" And what you what you did in there. Salsa level two is: Are you signing that so that we know it came from this organization, this build system? And then salsa level three is some additional constraints on it, on how it's built, to essentially enforce that the build itself can't have access to the to the to the signing secrets, right? Because you can imagine uh, a malicious developer comes in and says, "Hey, I'm going to sign whatever I want using that key," and all of a sudden, okay, I don't, you know. There's there's a lot of concerns there. Whereas so salsa level three by having that, um, you know, removed and having a a separate more isolated thing do the signing, it's a, you're in a much better spot. Yeah, let me try to clarify one thing. I mean, so because it is a bit complicated, but we have like three different dimensions at play here. We have one zero. It refers to the version of the specification. Within salsa one zero, we have different tracks. In fact. One zero focuses on one track, which is the build track. The expectation that there will be other tracks, like a source track later on, dependency tracks, and so on. We don't know, we don't have a full list yet, because it's kind of open-ended. But within each track, then we have levels that increases the, the, the insurance level that you can expect. And, and one way to think about salsa is also a bit of like a badging mechanism, right? So if you want a, today a build system, you're going to have, you know, and I think of Presca as a sample implementation, uh, if you will, of salsa. But this notion of salsa level three, it just means it's kind of like a, a badge that you can apply to a build system that says, yeah, we, we fulfill all the requirements for salsa one zero level three. And it gives you a series of, you know, uh, uh, insurances that come with it. And by the way, right now it's all going to be self-certification kind of thing. Pe anybody can claim whatever they want, but there is a proposal in the works within OpenSSF to develop a conformance program that will allow us to actually have a bit more rigor over those claims, so that there can be auditing made and so on. But so, um, Jay, let's go back to S2C2F. We heard quite a bit about Salsa, and you know, a lot of people asking, so what is S2C2F? Who is it for? We heard from you, it's more like on the consumer end. How do you position it with regard to Salsa? Absolutely. Um, consider S2C2F a companion um, to Salsa. Think of Salsa on one end, S2C2F on the other. Um, so if we look at the uh, spectrum of things, we think about source integrity, uh, we think about uh, build integrity, um, and, and we look at that, you know, across the spectrum and you come down and you think, okay, so Salsa, you know, Salsa is looking at, you know, build integrity over here and then we're gonna eventually going to get back to source integrity. But then dependency management, how do you manage the dependencies therein? And that's where you find S2C2F. Um, understanding some of the gaps uh, that each fill on each other um, when you consider uh, what's experienced from the end user perspective. Um, so even before you get to do it, you get to doing a get into the build process and you're actually consuming open source software. Well, how is your organization going about that? When you consider that you have an industry that's building a certain way then you have organizations within that industry that are building a certain way. And now you have business units within that, within that organization that are building a certain way. You're gonna have chaos. So how do you control that chaos? How do you create policy? How do you create the right governance? Putting the right people, processes, and technologies in place uh, to create that governance environment within your organization to get on the same sheet of music with how you're consuming uh, open source software and then how you're managing uh, those dependencies throughout each respective build process. Think of uh, version control. Think of 
um, you know, the, the way that you're, you're scanning, you're, you're checking in and checking out uh, components and, and binaries. Uh, think of all those things. And think about the end level of the end user, and that's where you have S2C2F. And then uh, jump on over into the build process and then begin to utilize the salsa framework uh, throughout your build process. All right, thank you. So what's the status of S2C2F? So, so S2C2F has been in 1.0 for a long time. Um, we, you know, we came in really at 1.0, um, which, which I, believe it or not, I was really kind of upset about. I'm like, dude, you know what I mean? This almost looks like, like, you know, it almost looks too complete, man. Like, do, you know, trim this fat a little bit, right? Um, good news on that. Scalability, right? We have had the pleasure of having people come in with new threats. And the idea is Microsoft has done it this way. But Microsoft is one organization. <laughs> it's one company, many different companies, many different companies doing wonderful things, right? What kind of cons uh, security concerns are they experiencing? What kind of issues are they experiencing? What kind of threats are they discovering? Bring that, and let's get that in, right? Um, like I said, eight practices, uh, four different levels. There are some levels that are aspirational at best, but I know when we have a whole level that's dedicated to a validating SBOMs, validating the quality of SBOMs, but inside of OpenSSF, we have an SBOMs everywhere uh, a group that's focusing on the idea of SBOMs. We have outside organizations that are focusing on SBOMs. Bring all that knowledge in. Let's, let's see wh where those gaps are and fill those things. So, so S2C2F, although it's at, at 1.0, we're, we're, we're preaching all over the place, right? We were just at RSA, uh, Adrian gave a, that's my partner in crime, um, inside of the SIG. Um, given that talk here, I'm here, we're everywhere. We're still in a position where it's so exciting, we could still scale and, and continue to make it better for everyone yeah, J is literally everywhere. You, you cannot, you know, join an OpenSSF call with that J being there. He, he's trying to compete with David Wu there. No, no, no. no. There's, 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 there's no competition, but but trust me, and it's getting kind of annoying. Wherever I'm at, Arno's at, okay? So you can so it's, it's getting kind of <laughs> All right. So, Laura, why don't you tell us a bit more maybe on the kind of threats that Salsa tries to mitigate? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, Michael touched on it a little bit about um, the compromised um, build process, and so uh, everyone's familiar with the, the S word, the solar winds that, like, has everybody talks about. But there's, um, there's also uh, um, uploading modified packages. Um, uh, Co Code Cove was a really good example of that happening um, in supply chain attacks as well. And there's um, just within the build process or the build track alone, um, we, you can um, look at not only the compromise of the build process also, but the, the use of that compromise and how um, uh, it, they can take that malicious package and uh, continue uh, to destroy reputations. And so I think um, Salsa um, helps a lot, even just with the, with the build track to mitigate those threats. Please, Okay, I'm gonna kind of be a pain in the butt here. So you say that Salsa would have stopped those attacks, but I know it wouldn't have stopped all of them. And I think we love to hand wave all of this stuff we're working on. It's like, oh yeah, solar winds would not have happened. Log4j yeah. would not have happened. But I think the reality is we have done a poor job as a group at the OpenSSF of like, concretely tying attacks to the things we're working on and how they would have actually stopped whatever it is we're talking about. So, yeah, I, I think... The gloves the, are off. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I, I, I definitely uh, uh, agree with you on, on that one. I think there's a lot better we can do. I also think that also as a um, industry, we when these sorts of events happen, everybody plays things very close to the vest. They don't want to really explain exactly how it happened. Problem, yes, right? exactly, exactly. <laughs> with that said, um, you know, I think it, 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 with everything else, it, the answer is it depends, right? It, you know, it, it, it depends on all sorts of factors. It's how rigorously, you know, some of this happened. You know, it, 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 did you do all your builds, Salsa, versus just one or two? Um, you know, when it comes to stuff like the solar winds attack, 
right? That like salsa level three would have helped out there because the thing that you, well, it depends on who you believe in which case of how solar winds got compromised. Was it an actual individual build or was it the build system itself? Because if it was an individual build, would have been protected with something like Salsa 3. If it was the entire build system itself, then maybe not. But the idea behind Salsa is you are securing your build system such that you're doing sort of the largely the right things. But like anything else, I think it, it, it all kind of depends. And it also depends on like how sophisticated the actor is. Like when you're talking about a very, very sophisticated, most likely state-sponsored <laughs> um, actor, there's you know, uh, how much money are you spending to secure your stuff is really what it comes down to. All right. So I, are, I, yeah. was, I was going to say, I, I would definitely not say that Salsa version 1.0 is going to prevent the next solar winds, but, um, and that's because when we talk about the, like, the other tracks that have not been fully formed yet, that's where I personally feel like they, like where we're missing with like the the source track and the um, and the the logging and access control because if you if you look at like the APT um, 41 um, Wicked Panda I think is what it's called and APT a APT 29 which is the the cozy bear of the uh, infamous solar winds those are the, the malicious um, uh, attacks were. Um, I mean, the initial attack vector was through um, the production uh, environment itself, and the malicious code was injected in the um, in something that was already signed. So, if you you're looking at the, you make a really good point because if you're all focused on like getting the package signed, um, well, they they didn't really care about that. They just went after the signed package anyway, um, and but because. Um, there's other, the future of Salsa, where you want to go in uh, and build out the source tracks, I think, uh, and also the, the, the build platform track, which is going to be another track, kind of jumping ahead of your question. But it's those are right. the kind of things um, that, that we can focus on in the, in the next, and if you want to join us. Yeah, go ahead. Continue on that track. I mean, yeah. the, the different tracks. So the status, as we said, there was one zero just came out. I think it's fair to say the group is taking a little bit of a breather. Mm -hmm. We're really pushing hard to get one zero out. So the last two or three weeks have been fairly quiet. I was personally out for two weeks, so that worked well for me. <laughs> but you know, as we pointed out, there are there is work. There is more work to be done. Uh, level four was taken out, as well as things like that are pertaining to the source management aspect. So Laura, can you tell us a little bit more? So oh, yes, for the the source track, um, I'm gonna get my, use my my cheat sheets on this one. Um, in ensuring the changes to the source code reflect the intent of the of the um, producer, would be the focus of the sor source track in the in the dot next. And then for um, build track, the current build track, um, you mentioned level four. That would be an, um, something to focus on as well, um, because even when uh, I did the um, the mapping to the executive order. Uh, a lot of the meat of the uh, executive order is in that level four. So but we, if we want to have like a complete alignment to industry standards, we, that's definitely important as well. And I think it's fair to say the group has not decided yeah. exactly what's going to be tackled on next. You know, it's still to be decided, but you know, there's a fairly long list and growing list because of course, once we adopted this notion of tracks, you know, you always have new people come in and say, how about a track on this? <laughs> so, so, there are some questions. Jack, actually, you had something hey, before. No, Sorry. Hey, yeah. Good day. Um, so, some of you may know me uh, in other circles as somebody who's very passionate about pair programming. Mm. I'm, I'm concerned that it's sort of being left out in the cold, or, or was certainly in the sort of the point, oh, in the point one version. So as, as things go forward on the source track, as that develops, uh, what can I do or, or what will you do to ensure that pair programming is, is not left out or made, so to speak, a thought crime? <laughs> um, so just to be clear, I love pair programming. So I think, um, I mean, first thing is I say, join the meetings, uh, like express that, you know, open up the issues uh, regarding that, you know, join the community. 
Um, you know, because I, I, I think one of the reasons why we had removed source was because we did, we felt like we weren't doing it a good enough. Uh, we were doing it to service by just only including a handful of things. And in addition to that, I think the things that we're also looking for is is folks' input on like how do we prove it, right? How do we prove that we did pair programming? Like maybe th is that going to be something like two people signing the same commit? Maybe I don't. know. There could be many other ways of proving that, and so. We're looking for folks who can come in and say, "Hey, we we want to do this practice, and I also have, uh, you know, input on how we might be able to implement that and prove that in like a salsa source provenance attestation." All right, one more question here. All right, and uh, apologies if this has already been answered, but um, relating back to the gentleman's question over there um, about like how do we know if following these frameworks actually would have prevented certain types of attacks. Um, are these frameworks being developed against any specific threat matrices or TPPs or sets of risk frameworks that are like mapped so that we can say this directly attributes to that? Um, and also is it being used to determine what the next tracks are going to be as you divert, you know, develop next iterations? Um, y so on that end, yes. Uh, exactly which ones, I'm not exactly sure. But there is, like the ones that it's current, like the threats that we're currently focused on when it comes to the build step is literally the build itself, as well as the arrows that go into the build. So how, like are we essentially enforcing that a build is only pulling, you know, what it thinks it's pulling, right? Which, once again, the integrity of what that thing might be is part of the source track, but generally is the build at least attempting to pull from the right places? And then, like, oh, what are the threats against that? And, and you know, have we seen similar attacks where, hey, like a DNS poisoning attack or something like that, where, you know, those sorts of things. Also, the same thing goes when it comes to sort of dependencies, right? And that's kind of part of the salsa provenance piece is by essentially um, recording what we're pulling in. We have a lot more information. Um, and assuming you trust that, you know, you've secured everything and that what's generating this provenance is actually generating the correct stuff. Then you know the threats against you know dependencies like yeah you might still be building malicious software but you've recorded that you've built malicious software with these malicious packages, um, and then the same thing goes when it comes to like then publishing right you can go and say yep I recorded that I built this artifact with this hash it was signed, and then when I go to but when I look at my um, you know package repository I see a different hash what happened something must have gone in there and you know, uh, manipulated it or pushed something to our package repository without going through our salsa build process. And with uh, S2C2F, it, its main base is in SSDF and uh, it uses an actual threat matrix to, to develop its mitigators, to develop its controls, right? So we consider things like typo squatting, we consider salt stacking, we consider uh, you know, my, my friend and, and anyone who's ever uh, broken into a, a, a web service before, PHP, uh, PHP, my admin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it takes those it takes those threats, and it, and it looks at well, what are the mitigators to those threats, and that's how the controls themselves are developed. And as I said before, you take the four different levels and how you, and the mitigators you're using, whether it be uh, uh, whether they're being automated, right? You you have automated tools that help with mitigation. Etc. cetera, um, you go through the four different levels. So it could be as simple as the, the level one where it's just minimum uh, open source software governance, right? And then, you know, scanning for no vulnerabilities. All the way until, you know, you, you, get, to, um, you get to three and you're, and you're doing, um, you know, you're doing zero day detection, you're doing uh, malicious, uh, malicious, def uh, malicious defense, and you're now doing, uh, doing scans of, 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 uh, of cloned or, or, or mirrored open source uh, software repositories, right? That's at level three, right? So, so, so all of that stuff is taken from actual real threats that have been experienced. That's why I said whatever threats, uh, whatever concerns, whatever security concerns, let's put up an issue. Hey, there's a new threat because that can go in to the framework, into the matrix, uh, a, a, um, a mitigator can be assigned to it and then of course a control can be assigned to that and then that can be assigned to one of the levels saying, hey, in order to meet this level, you must apply this control which mitigates against this threat. That's all. all right, so we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope it did clarify some of this stuff. 
I do want to point out that, you know, that's actually a characteristic of Linux Foundation projects slash foundations. It, they are open to all. Is you know, there's a membership if you want to, to support it financially, but it's not a requirement to participate in any of the work. So, you know, if you have any interest, please join us. Uh, this is the link to the main website, obviously, but there is a community calendar that's uh, open. You can look it up and you can see all the calls that are happening throughout the week and uh, you can join. Don't be shy, we all started at one point. You can just show up. At first you say nothing, you just look what's going on, you listen in. Usually we make an effort to invite newcomers to introduce themselves, have a chance to say, hey, hi, this is why I'm here. But you don't even have to do it if you don't feel comfortable. And then slowly you listen in and then maybe you'll feel more comfortable after a couple of calls and you can start speaking and contributing. Every contribution is very welcome. So I can only encourage you to join us uh, there is plenty of work to do, uh, so please do so. And I want to thank my co-panelists today. Thank you all. Thank you.